Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sunday to everybody. Good to see you here this 18th day of April 2021. The church calendar tells us this is the third Sunday of Easter. It's good to have everybody here in our sanctuary and those that are watching us on our, our Facebook page. Uh, the Lord has given us a beautiful day today. So I encourage everybody to get outside and enjoy God's creation uh, this afternoon. I uh, hope everybody had a good week. Uh, as you can imagine, it was a, it was a tough week uh, for me uh, dealing with the announcement of this past uh, Sunday. And uh, I talked to a lot of you, sent emails, texts, uh, calls, that kind of stuff. And what I found was that as, as I was working on the sermon and the liturgy for today, uh, it was talking more about the transition than it was about Jesus. And that's not right, right? Because we gather this morning to worship. We gather this morning to pray and to sing and to hear the word proclaimed, to hear scripture read to us. We come to bring God our joys and give thanks. We also come with our sorrows and ask for help. And so... Quite honestly, I don't plan on mentioning the transition again until maybe the last Sunday um, because that would be unfair to you and I think it would be unfair to, to all of us. So just because I'm not mentioning it doesn't mean that I don't care about it or your feelings. If you have questions or concerns, let me know. Um, or you could ask Glenna or Jackie or Ann. They've been sitting in on the meetings uh, that they've, we've been having with Gil about the, the new appointment. But from here on, we're going we're gonna to worship, and we're going to proclaim the goodness of our resurrected Lord, and we're going to do what we have done every Sunday since I've been here, and what you will continue to do every Sunday after we, after we move. But having said that, does anybody have any announcements, any prayer requests, any joys they want to share, anything on their minds this morning? Anybody else this morning? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer together. When we are blinded by anger, you pour out your love for all to see. When we wonder what tomorrow will bring, you call us to trust in you. When sadness fills our lives, you plant gladness in our hearts. God of Easter, touch us with your grace. You show us your hands so we may reach out to mend the broken. You show us your feet so we may walk with those the world passes by. You show us your face so we may know what our sisters and brothers look like. Risen Christ, touch us with your compassion. You open our eyes so we may see God's love. You open our minds so we may welcome God's word. You open our lips so we may be God's witnesses. Spirit of hope, touch us with your peace. God in community, holy in one, open us to your presence as we come together in worship this morning. We pray this in the strong, beautiful name of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus, in whose name we say, Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is To Thine Be the Glory. We'll sing verses 1 and 3. The words will be up here on the screen, or if you'd rather hold it in your hand, it's on page 308 of our hymnal. But I encourage you to stand as we sing our first hymn this morning.
may be seated. I want to invite you now, friends, to join me as we say together our call to worship. When we are confused, Lord, give us peace. When we are afraid, Lord, give us peace. When we are lost in grief, Lord, give us peace. O oh God, meet us in this room and grant us peace. Amen. As we come now to our first reading of Scripture for this Sunday morning, and we await with joyous anticipation what the Lord would have revealed to us through His written Word, I'd like to invite you to join me as we say together our prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from 1 John, or sometimes referred to as the first letter of John. We're going to be in the third chapter, taking a look at verses 1 through 7. So again, this is 1 John chapter 3. Verses 1 through 7. And John writes this for us this morning. He says, See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he was righteous. My friends, this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God. Thanks be to God. Well, that, friends, brings us to our time of confession before God and, and one another. A few weeks ago, we talked about how this really should be a daily occurrence. That each day we are tempted, each day we fall short, each day we do something we know we should not have. But it is always appropriate, I think, when gathered in the midst of your brothers and sisters in Christ, I think this confession takes on a little more power because we know that we are all in this room gathered sinners. And that means we are in need of a Savior. And so as we pray this prayer of confession together, the first part will be in silence. And I encourage you in the silence of that space to reflect honestly, earnestly on the past week, those places that maybe didn't go the way it should have. To bring those transgressions, those temptations, those sins to the Lord, seeking forgiveness. Knowing that though our God is just, our God is also merciful, eager to forgive his children, should we just come to him with an honest heart. So let us now, friends, pray a prayer of confession together. Wondrous God, we confess that at times our doubts and fears override our hope and faith. Forgive us when we lose sight of the joy of your love and instead fall into despair and gloom. Lift up our spirits, Lord, and help us to remember the promise of new life here and now, not just the hope of resurrection for the future. We give thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, who continues to offer us new life, who continues to turn us around and upside down, who continues to break down the walls of death in our own lives. Forgive us, 
restore us and renew us. In the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, friends, the tomb is empty. The stone has been rolled away. We talked about this three weeks ago. There is no darkness now. There is only light. And God continues to renew and to restore us. We are forgiven. We are loved. We are restored. Receiving the gift of new life. And the promise of resurrection now. And so friends, in the name of Christ Jesus, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I'd like to invite you now, friends, to join me as we say together our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, friends, our sermon text for this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. We'll be in the 24th chapter, reading verses 36b, which just means you start where the comma is in verse 36. But we're 36b, going all the way to verse 48. So again, this is Luke chapter 24, 36b, going on to verse 48. And it says, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. He said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Friends, again, this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God. Thanks be to God. Well, this morning I want to start by reading to you a quote. And as I read this quote, I want you to think in your mind who your guess would be as to the source of the quote. Who do you think said this? Right? And here's the quote. I would say that if you don't believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ and Messiah, and that he rose again from the dead, and by his sacrifice our sins are forgiven, you're really not in any meaningful sense a Christian. Now, I'm not going to ask for your answer. I would imagine that most of the guesses could range from anywhere from Billy Graham to Max Licato to Charles Stanley. The quote is actually from a guy whose name is Christopher Hitchens. Has anybody in here ever heard of Christopher Hitchens? Well, he was, at his time, one of the best-known atheists of the last 25 years. He didn't believe in God. He didn't believe in an afterlife. 
He passed away in 2011 from cancer, so I guess he found out real quick how wrong he was. But he recognized this, the resurrection of Christ Jesus, as the fundamental belief shared by anyone and everyone who calls themselves Christians. He understood the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ to Christianity. Now, of course, he didn't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And that's one of the many ways that somebody could respond upon hearing about the resurrection. But for us this morning, the question is, how do you respond? Assuming that everybody in here believes in the resurrection of Christ Jesus, we have to start asking ourselves, what's next? We've done Lent. We've done Holy Week. We came together and celebrated Easter. But friends, the resurrection of Christ Jesus cannot be something we simply remember and celebrate one day a year, like we do birthdays or the 4th of July or our anniversary. Our hearts, our minds, our very lives need to be lived in response to the truth of the resurrection. In our story this morning, the 11 disciples have received the news that Jesus is alive. I like the contrast between our story this morning and the one we read last week about Thomas. See, last week we read about how the one who was on the outside, Thomas, comes to the upper room where the disciples are. They tell them they have seen the risen Lord, and he doesn't believe. In our story this morning, you got the two fellas on the Emmaus Road are coming into the upper room to tell the disciples of Christ's return and they don't believe. So it's the exact opposite of what we read last week. But the common thread between the two stories is of course Jesus and his presence with them. But the other disciples in our story haven't met Jesus quite yet this morning. But once they do, how they respond teaches us how we should respond to the news and the promise of the resurrection. When we hear about the resurrection of Christ Jesus, we can respond in peace and not fear. What's the first thing that Jesus says when he appears to the followers, both here and last week in the Thomas story? He says, peace be with you. Jesus is offering peace to a group of brothers and sisters who are really scared. John's gospel told us last week they were hiding behind locked doors because they were so frightened. Now certainly we lock our doors at night, don't we, in our cars when we go into a, a store or something to feel safe. But their fear is even more real because they are afraid of suffering a similar fate as Jesus. Luke says they were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. And Jesus says, why are you frightened? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? They feel fear, they feel anxiety, they, they feel doubt. All normal responses, I think, to hearing that someone has risen from the dead. And these feelings are especially relatable if that person you are seeing in front of you, you also saw, saw die three days earlier. But in the face of all this, Jesus offers to his disciples and to us today, friends, true and lasting peace. The Bible's understanding of peace it's based on the Old Testament word shalom. And you guys have heard that word before. Which isn't just the absence of conflict, but is the presence of blessing. It's wholeness, it's virtue, it's flourishing throughout all life. It's the way that things ought to be with God and with each other. Shalom is the exact opposite of hiding behind a locked door. So I must ask, what door are you hiding behind? What key have you thrown away because life is just too much? It's too scary. It's too hard. You can't take it anymore. You've locked away your heart from God and from others. You've had enough. If one more thing happens, you're going to break down. Well, friends, this morning, Jesus wants to appear to you behind your locked door. 
He wants to show up with the power of his resurrection with shalom, with peace. If there's anyone who can bring life to your situation, no matter how it feels right now, it's Jesus. So our first response to the resurrection of Jesus is peace, not fear. What's next? Belief, not doubt. Jesus sets out to conquer their fear by inviting his followers to look at his hands, look at his, touch me, he says. But at first they don't believe. They're still too overwhelmed. This is just too good to be true. So to prove he's not a ghost, what does Jesus do? He eats some food. They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it in their presence. And when the disciples begin to experience the reality of the resurrection, they believe. But the question, I think, for our cynical culture is, can we believe? Can we trust their witness? Can we trust this account of the resurrection? And of course we can. And here's how. It's because those first followers were willing to die for their faith. They were willing to die for their belief in the resurrection. Why would they willingly die and be tortured for something they knew to be alive? Now, I guess it makes sense for somebody maybe to suffer and die for something they think is true, but don't really know if it is or not, but it doesn't make any sense for somebody to willingly die or suffer for something they know to be false, especially if it doesn't benefit them with wealth or power or fame. If the disciples made the whole thing up, their life of suffering just doesn't make any sense. You want to know how else I know? Watergate. Say, what? Watergate. One of my favorite explanations of why we can believe the truth of the resurrection comes from an unlikely place. It's a guy named Chuck Colson. I don't know if you guys remember Chuck Colson. He was one of Richard Nixon's inner circle. And he was all caught up in Watergate. And here's where I like to remind you that Richard Nixon was a Duke graduate. Anyway, Chuck Colson found Christ while he was serving in prison. And here's what he says. I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. So friends, the fact that Jesus appeared to his 11 disciples and they were willing to leave the safety of locked doors and go out and suffer and die for Jesus tells us that what they saw was real. Jesus did rise from the dead. So our first response to the resurrection is peace and not fear. Our second is belief and not doubt. So what's next? Sharing, not silence. Jesus again reminds his disciples like he did on the road to Emmaus of why the scriptures matter. In verse 44 he said, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. But friends, you can study your Bible your whole life and never really get it. Which is why verse 45 is the key. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. In order for us to share the scriptures and the message of Jesus, we need the Holy Spirit to open our minds and hearts so we can first understand them. This doesn't mean we have to understand them perfectly, but we need to understand them well enough to see our need for Jesus. As followers of Jesus, we are called to share, not be silent. But my experience has been that silence is our normal mode of operation. And after a while, we get so comfortable not sharing Jesus, it becomes difficult to imagine sharing him. I want to challenge all of us to get a little bit uncomfortable in that silence. 
I pray that Christ will help you truly believe in his resurrection so much that you will be willing to share and go out this week and share your faith with just one person. You may say, well, I can't. I don't know how. I don't know the Bible well enough. Well, friend, that's nonsense. If you've come to know Jesus, you believe in his resurrection, you have everything you need to share. We did an exercise with the FCA group at the high school a few weeks ago. I want to share it with you this morning. To prepare to share about Christ, all you have to do is ask yourself three questions. What was my life like before Christ? How did I meet Christ? How has my life been since accepting Christ? Those three questions are all you need to share the impact that Jesus has had in your life with somebody. Before Christ, how you came to Christ, and how you have grown in Christ. So, so far, three responses to the resurrection are peace, not fear, belief, not doubt, and sharing, not silence, which leads to our final what's next. Praise, praise, and more praise. If we keep on reading until the end of the Gospel of Luke, and read into Acts, which really is just Luke part 2, we read that 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus takes his disciples up to the Mount of Olives, just outside the town of Bethany near Jerusalem, and he blesses them, and then Jesus ascends into heaven to rule and reign until he comes again. And the disciples show us that the only proper response is worship and praise. Because that's what they do. We didn't read this part, but later on in verses 52 to 53 it says, And they worshipped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. Continually in the temple, blessing and praising God. Isn't that a wonderful picture? Continually in the temple, blessing and praising God. As we think about our responses to the resurrection, friends, I hope it will fill us with peace and not fear, belief and not doubt, sharing, not silence, and praise, 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 and more praise. Praise when we wake up. Praise during our day. Praise before we go to sleep at night. In the end, though, I think how we respond to the resurrection depends a lot on who we think Jesus is. One of the cool things that Facebook does is that every now and then it reminds you of a post you made sometime in the past. Might be a year ago, two years ago, what have you. This past Thursday, I got a notification of a post that I made April 16th, 2017. I had to go back and look and see what was so special about that date, but that was Easter Sunday in 2017. And it's funny that it came up this week because it ties in, I think, beautifully with the end of this message. And here was my post. I said, let's not let the feelings of hope and love and joy we feel today, again Easter, end when we go to sleep. Wake up tomorrow and be strengthened by the Holy Spirit to be the feet, hands, mouth, and ears of Jesus toward our neighbors. He is resurrected and at work in our world. He is not idle, nor has he developed laryngitis. He is alive and among us as our priest to forgive us, our prophet to teach us, our king to rule us, and our shepherd to guide us. Hear that again. He is resurrected and at work in our world. He is not idle, nor has he developed laryngitis. He is alive and among us as our priest to forgive us, a prophet to teach us, our king to rule us, our shepherd to guide us. Friends, how do we respond to that? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, let us pray. Lord Jesus, we can scarcely imagine seeing you face to face. It's even harder to imagine looking at each other and seeing you perfectly reflected in everyone's face. Thank you for that promise. Give us grace when it's hard to see you and ourselves and each other, to cling to that promise and to catch a glimpse of your love shining through. Make your church in your image. In its words, let unbelievers hear your challenge, forgiveness, and invitation. In its deeds, let them see your love. In its worship, let them see your beauty. 
and his cross bearing, let them see your life. Give your persecuted sisters and brothers the grace to speak Peter's words to their tormentors. You act in ignorance. Repent, believe in him, and be forgiven. Make this congregation bold to proclaim you as our risen Lord. Help us to speak and act in ways that reflect your holiness and love to those around us. Grant to our children your dearest blessings. Teach them to trust you with all their heart and to find happiness in sharing your love with their friends and family. Deliver all people from the powers of sin, evil, and death. Raise up leaders who seek to do your Father's will. Look with kindness upon all who tend the land and feed the nations with the fruits of their labor. We pray on behalf of all who needs of body, soul, and mind are great. Especially we lift before you now the needs of those dear to us that we name before you in the silence of this space, either aloud with our lips or privately in our hearts. Change their suffering into patient endurance and their sorrow into enduring hope. Grant to us all that is in accordance with your will, dear Jesus, and accomplish your salvation among us. For you are risen from the dead and dwell in majesty with your Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, as we pray the words our Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Friends, I want to remind you that our offering plates are both here at the altar and also on the way out of the sanctuary. If you brought a gift and offering or God's tithe this morning, I encourage you to deposit uh, once uh, worship is done. But it is in appreciation of your continued giving and in anticipation of future giving, I want to say a prayer over our tithes, gifts, and offerings at this time. Let us pray. Mighty God, who brings life and hope out of death and despair, help us hear the invitation Christ offered to the disciples, touch me and see. Make us bold to grab a hold of the risen Christ, not just for this day, but for all our days. May we offer our gifts this morning to the church that is still being born, that Christ will bring into the future. May our eyes and ears and hearts continue to hold on to him as we help Christ lead his church forward. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, you can see that we have 19 prayer quilts here on our altar and, and over in the, the choir loft. And so we're going to bless them. And I want to encourage anyone who wants to come forward at this time to do so to help me with it. I'll just ask you to lay hands on the quilts. So if you want to come forward now, those that feel so led will bless these, these quilts before they make their way out to the community and surrounding area. Father God, we give thanks to you for the gifts and talents that you give your beloved children. Gifts and talents that you give to us that are meant to share the gospel message to all corners of the world. And so Father, you've given the, the folks here the gift and talents of, of making these beautiful quilts out of pieces of fabric and thread. We know they are made with love, Lord, and we just simply ask that you bless these quilts, that you instill within them your power, your grace, your hope, your mercy, the joy that only you can bring so that those that receive them can know the goodness of your love. I give you thanks, Lord, for all the ways that this church works to make disciples. I give thanks to you, Lord, for the outreach that, the, that these prayer quilts represent. Father, we know that you love us, and we thank you for giving us the chance to show your love to others through these quilts. We pray these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Friends, as you're making your way back to your seats, I'll invite you to remain standing. Our closing hymn this morning is, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. The words will be up here, but it's also page 462 of your hymn. now these words of our benediction. Go now as God's chosen witnesses to testify that Christ has been raised and that we are raised with him. Do not look for him among the dead, but be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And may God raise you from all that would entomb you. May Christ Jesus call you by name and go ahead of you. And may the Holy Spirit empower you for all that is good. We go in peace now to love and serve the Lord.